Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on behavior-based grazing management with Dr. Daryl Emick. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension and you can find all of our published articles, videos, and upcoming and recorded webinars at eExtension.org slash organic underscore production. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Daryl Emick is the former state grazing land management specialist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in New York. He earned his MS degree in resource management and ecology and his PhD in range science from Utah State University. For more than 30 years, Daryl has worked with farmers in the Northeast on grazing based livestock production systems. And I might add that we were very fortunate that Daryl spent some time here in Vermont working with our extension Champlain Valley Crop Soils and Pasture team where he published a guide called Managing Pasture as a Crop. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to folks a little bit about behavior based grazing management as a plant herbivore interaction um, with specific reference to some of the factors that influence foraging behavior and diet selection in herbivores. I want to start with uh, two different definitions, one for behavior and the other is for behavior based grazing management. Behavior as it turns out is anything an organism does that we can measure. And I use the word organism because even plants have behavior in that they grow under different conditions at different rates and they change in yield, quality, and toxicity over time. Behavior uh -oh. can be as simple as a reflexive response, something like the knee jerk reaction. You know, when you go to the doctor and he whacks you on the kneecap with a small rubber hammer to see if you're still alive, or eye blinking or jumping at the sound of a loud noise. And in plant behavior, it can be something as simple as a yield response to a fertilizer application. Or behavior can be more complex. You know, it can deal with things like group dynamics, mating rituals, or foraging behavior and diet selection. And in plant behavior, it can be really complex, something as uh, plant community ecology. Well, as it turns out, behavior is a, a combination of two things. First, it's nature and it's also nurture. And when we say nature, we mean it's under genetic control. For example, the goat in this picture, these two goats, muted it's because they have the genetic profile of a goat. They can't be anything else because their genes dictate that they are goats. The plants that they're eating, grass plants, whatever they might be, are also under genetic control and so they can't be anything other than the grass plant that they are. However, however, the actual behavior of these animals and plants is shaped by the environmental experiences, the nurturing that goes on day by day. If you look at the goat here in the if you look at the goats in the upper left hand corner, they're born and raised in a part of the world where small trees happen to be uh, the only thing there is to eat. So if you're a goat that lives in that part of the world, you get good at climbing trees and you're good at browsing. The goats over here in the upper right hand corner uh, are great browsing again on sagebrush, rabbit brush, and they don't have to climb trees. Down here in the lower left corner, we've got goats that are raised, born and raised in a part of the world where perhaps they're only going to be grazers, not browsers. So they're having to learn these things. So they're learning how to eat uh, grasses and legumes rather than having to climb trees to find something to eat. And over here in the lower right hand corner, we have urban goats and they have to learn two things. The first thing they need to learn is what to eat in amongst the railroad tracks and they also have to learn what the train schedule is. So behavior then is two parts. It's part nature, it's part nurture, 
and it is a function of consequences. Positive consequences increase the likelihood of a behavior and negative consequences decrease the likelihood of a behavior. E.L. Thorndike back in 1911 called this the law of effect. He said if an animal engages in a particular behavior and the outcome results in a satisfying state of affairs for the animal, the animal will likely repeat the behavior. On the other hand, if an animal engages in a particular behavior and the outcome results in an annoying state of affairs for the animal, the animal will likely not repeat the behavior. For example, I think everybody knows that a little kitten loves to play with a rolling ball. If you roll a ball across the floor, little kittens will chase after it, they'll bat it around, they'll dribble it around, they'll play with it by the hour. So apparently that is a satisfying state of affairs for little kittens when it comes to playing with balls. However, no matter how good a kitten is at playing with the ball when it's young, I don't recommend that they continue to chase after balls when they become adults because sooner or later they're going to discover when that foot hits the ball probably something more than an annoying state of affairs. So as it turns out then, behavior is a function of its consequences. Behavior-based grazing management. I view that as the incorporation of behavioral principles in grazing management planning that enable us to enhance animal well-being, ecosystem health, and enterprise sustainability. Instead of fighting the nature of the beast at our cost in time, money, oil, and effort, we simply transform behavioral principles and processes into low or no cost management strategies and practices that seek to accommodate what animals need rather than dictate what they're going to get and under what conditions. And certainly that's quite a divergence from where we have been going in animal agricultural systems over the past 50 years. In industrial-based animal management, animals are thought of as little more than trivial machines where we force them to live under circumstances that they don't really care about. And we force them to eat foods that they may not even like. Whereas in behavior-based management, we recognize that these animals are not machines. They're living, breathing, feeling social creatures. They have likes and dislikes. They feel pain, discomfort, and stress. They prefer familiar foods to novel foods, mixed diets to monotonous diets, familiar environments to unfamiliar environments. And furthermore, they prefer to be with their companions rather than with strangers. So the more we recognize and accommodate the nutritional and the behavioral needs of our animals rather than dictate what they're going to get and under what circumstances, the more contented and productive both they and we will be and the better able we're going to be to utilize and manage our grassland resources. Have you ever wondered why your animals eat the things they do, or they don't eat things you think they should, or they eat some things at some times and places, but not at other times or other places? Conversely, have you ever wondered why some of your plants in your pastures get eaten over and over again, while others are never touched? Or the same plant species will get eaten in one place and time, but not in another place or time? Well, I've got some bad news if you think there's something wrong with your plants or animals. As it turns out, they're simply behaving as they should within the ever-changing dynamics of the plant-herbivore interaction. Grazing animals are a part of the plant's environment, and the plant is a part of the animals. So long as the two live together, each is dependent on the other for survival. I think we all know that animals 
influence plants. They eat them, and that's quite an influence. So defoliation is the first thing our animals do. While they're eating these plants, they're trampling on them. And the final insult to the plant, I guess, would be altering the nutrient dynamics. Certainly trying to live under a cow pie is not the easiest thing for a plant to do. And certainly if the animal continually got the upper hand over the plants, the plants would be severely injured. In many cases, they would die. In the long term, that would not be good for the animals either. So we also know that plants influence animals. Hopefully the influ influence is that the animal will get nutrients from the plants. Energy, protein, vitamins, vitamins, minerals, and those sorts of things. They do. But fortunately or unfortunately, plants don't give up their nutrients easily. And over the millennia, they have developed defense mechanisms which allow plants to avoid, tolerate, and even resist being eaten or being defoliated. They have stickers, prickers, toxins, thorns, growth form, as well as spatial and temporal variations in forage quality, quantity, toxicity, and plant availability. And certainly if the, ant, if the plant got, continually got the upper hand and was no longer edible, or if an animal ate the plant, it was so toxic that they couldn't survive, uh, certainly there would be far fewer herbivores walking around eating plants. So in the plant herbivore dynamic, the only constant, as it turns out, is change. And in order to survive, each in the presence of the other, both plants and animals have to continually adapt or they die. So the question is, how do animals learn what to eat? Plants are crammed right full of toxins. Some of them are nutritious. Some of them have stickers and prickers and thorns and all those sorts of things. So how do they learn how and what to eat? Well, as it turns out, herbivores have been eating plants for a very long time. Ruminant digestion and nutrition date back to somewhere around 400 million years ago, about the time the first vascular plants showed up in the fossil record. And these would be the plants that had the stems and the stalks and the root systems rather than just single-celled algaes. So shortly after these plants showed up in the fossil record, the bones of, of animals showed up. And by, by uh, association, people figured out that those plants were being eaten by animals. So later on, fossil remains of cattle-like animals were found in India, and they date back to two million years. And the ancestor of our modern cattle, the aurochs, like the ones here in the, the French um, cave paintings, date back some 750,000 years ago. Humans didn't start domesticating animals until about 8,000 or 9,000 years ago. And the full confinement feeding of animals like we do on many conventional dairy farms, that's only been around for about 60 years. And in many places, they still don't do that. They still have animals out feeding themselves on pasture. So they've been doing it for a very long time. They've been harvesting their own foods. They've been figuring out what to eat. And at this date in time, all the parts are still here. Most of our herbivores, most of our livestock, are in fact ruminants, and they still have rumens. They have eyes, they have a good sense of smell, touch, taste, and hearing, and all of these parts are still used, some to be, prevent themselves from being eaten, others to find food for themselves. It doesn't really take that much time when you're out in a pasture with the grazing animal to see them using all of these particular parts, these special senses as they're called. They use their eyesight to find something to eat. And this big old cow's got her eye on something, giving it the big eye. They look at it. Generally speaking, they use their eyesight to locate certain locations within a pasture. But every once in a while, you'll see them actually look at a particular plant and go directly to it. So the first thing they do is they look, they use their, their sense of eyesight, they'll use their sense of smell. A lot of smelling, sniffing and snorting goes on when they're out in the pasture looking for something to eat. 
They also use their sense of, sense of touch. Facial vibrissa, these whiskers on the nose of this dairy cow. There's a whole fringe of these little whiskers around the muzzle of the animal. Very, very sensitive. In fact, they are neurologically connected to the brain in a one-to-one -one, uh, neurological connection. And to make sense of this neurological connection that's one-to-one, -one, I would ask you to take two fingers and place them on your lips. Just place two fingers on your lips. Your lips are one-to-one -one neurologically connected to your brain so that it only takes one neuron firing in your lip or the facial vibrissa of this cow, just one neuron to fire in the brain that says, I'm being touched. So if you take those two fingers and you put them on your lips, you can tell that there's two fingers. I don't care how close you put your fingers on your lips, you can tell there's two fingers there. If you take your same two fingers and touch yourself in the shoulder or maybe your chest, you have to separate your fingers quite a little ways in order to tell there's two fingers touching you on your shoulder or your chest. It takes more than one neuron firing these, these receptor sites on your chest. It takes more than one to fire before it's noticed by your brain that you're being touched. So in this sense then, the reason that humans kiss with their lips and not with their chest is, well, I guess you know the rest of that story. But the point I want to make here is those are so sensitive that they swing their faces back and forth through the forages and they're able to detect forage value based on fiber value. And they use the facial vibrissa to do that. And this all occurs long before the animal reaches out and takes a bite of whether, whatever it is that it has selected to eat. And then once the animal has eaten, actually ingested the food, they are very good at evaluating what they've just eaten post-ingestively. I think everybody that's listening to this at one point in time or another has eaten something and the post-ingestive evaluation may not have been that good. Just think about it for a second. So as it turns out, while modern livestock little resemble their wild ancestors or their untamed relatives, it seems they've shared a common evolutionary history and a developmental path. They've searched for food. They lo located places to drink. They had to find shelter. They had to avoid predators. And all these things were matters of life or death. Those that survived represent the lineage of our modern livestock. And I don't think there's much evidence anywhere that suggests that in the few short years that they've been domesticated, they've entirely lost what took millions of years of evolutionary history and natural selection to create. And what they've created through this time period is a very sophisticated mechanism for evaluating the foods in their diets. Animals process information about foods through two interrelated systems. One is called the cognitive or voluntary system, and the other is the affective or involuntary system. And the taste of the food ties the two together. The cognitive or voluntary system integrates the senses of sight, smell, touch, and taste with information gained from mom, peers, and trial and error experience to make conscious choices concerning what to or what not to eat. And of all these things that, that they're using, this information gained from mom, peers, and trial and error experience, by far, one is far more important than all the rest. And if you hadn't guessed it, it's learning through mom. If mom eats it and baby watches, baby eats what mom eats. And that actually makes quite a bit of sense because when you look at the nutritional requirements of, of animals over time, you see that when we're young, we have a very high need for high quality nutrients. And as we become adults, our need for a lot of food of high quality goes down. Animals that are pregnant or lactating have a higher need for nutrients again. 
And then, of course, in older age, it goes back down. But when you look at the requirements for that lactating female, she's out grazing and she's looking for foods that meet her nutritional requirements. Baby also has very high nutritional requirements. So if mom eats it and baby is watching, baby is learning what to eat that also will meet her or its nutritional requirements as well. The other system at work is called the effective or the involuntary system. And this is one of those things that's a subconscious connection between an animal's brain and gut that links the taste of a particular food with its unique post-ingestive consequences. Animals, including ourselves, are crammed right full of internal receptors. We've got chemical receptors, we've got osmotic receptors, we've got mechanical receptors. If an animal takes a bite of food and it burns their mouth and burns their stomach or their rumen, that's going to be the chemical receptor that's in there evaluating the uh, chemistry of that plant. If you drink, if you eat a whole lot of salty food and you feel thirsty, those would be your osmotic receptors that are evaluating those foods. And certainly if you eat a whole bunch of beans and you're feeling bloated and gassy, those are the mechanical receptors that are doing that job. We have those receptors and our animals have those receptors as well. And so that's tying the, the taste of the food then, the taste of the food to the post-ingestive feedback. And that's called learning through consequences. If an animal eats a food and it tastes good and it feels good and it makes them feel like they can outrun the predators that are chasing them, high energy content, healthy animal, that food is viewed as palatable and animals acquire preferences for those foods. On the other hand, if an animal eats a food, burns their lips and burns their stomach and they feel nauseous afterwards, they don't have any energy and they're certainly uh, not able to escape predators, those foods are viewed as unpalatable and animals acquire aversions to those kind of foods. I do think it's important to recognize, however, there is no such thing as a food that's always palatable and always preferred. I know a lot of times people, when you ask them what their favorite food is, they can rattle off something that they really, really like, and they will eat that under most circumstances. Under other situations, you talk to folks about what their animals like to eat, and they say, oh, they prefer one kind of grass over another all the time. Well, that may not be exactly the way it works. For example, as an adult, I happen to like my foods just a little bit on the spicy side. So if I were to go to a Mexican restaurant and they would bring salsa and chips, I would ask that my salsa be pretty spicy. I like hot salsa with my chips. And if I was to go out for chicken wings and beer, not that I would do such a thing, but if I were to go out for chicken wings and beer, I would ask that my chicken wings be also on the fairly hot side. However, I don't think that Gerber would stand a chance of ever selling a single jar of red hot salsa as a baby food. And I don't think I need to say any more than take a look at the expression on this little guy's face. So I think that the notion of, of foods being palatable and always being preferred kind of goes out the window in a big hurry, especially when you look at the age of an animal and the kind of foods that it eats. Um, how about your favorite food and you're in the second day of having the flu? You have a temperature of 102. You've been busy at both ends for a couple of days. And somebody says, I have brought you your favorite food. So how much of that do we really eat? And is it really preferred? And is it really palatable? Probably not. You also need to keep in mind that every single animal, every individual of a species is unique. Some animals are different colors, even though they're the same species. Some are larger. Some are smaller. Um, all kinds of differences on the outside. And if you think they look different on the outside, they're even more different on the inside. Brain size and function, 
uh, rumen, stomach content, how much it can hold, how much, um, what are the bacteria in a rumen that are helping to digest the foods. Um, liver function, a lot of our foods are, are toxic, and I'll talk more about that later. So the liver has to detoxify and eliminate many foods. And certainly the endocrine glands, the whole animal's being on the inside is as different as it looks on the outside. And the result of these difference, differences is that no two animals will likely eat the same kind of foods or in the exact same amounts. Just to show that, um, Dr. Fred Provenza out at Utah State University and one of his graduate students uh, had 24 lambs that they had in individual pens for about two weeks and they fed these animals as much as they wanted to eat barley and alfalfa pellets. And intake in grams per day over the two week period shows a very interesting pattern. These white bars represent the amount of barley, which is high in energy, that the animals preferred. And the purple is the amount of alfalfa that the animals preferred. Now these 24 lambs were the same age, the same weight, the same sex, and the same breed. If you went to a textbook on what to feed an animal, you should be able to look that up in a book and it would say, you should feed this amount of barley and this amount of alfalfa and you will meet the nutritional requirements of an animal of that age, weight, and size. And yet when you give the animal the opportunity to select its own diet for its own uniqueness, you discover there's not a single animal, maybe these two right here come pretty close, but there's not a single animal in these 24 animals, 24 lambs, that ate the exact same ratio of barley to alfalfa. And that's a protein to energy relationship. Not a one of them ate the same amount. So what does that say then about total mixed rations for meeting the requirements of what we would call an average animal? I'm not sure that it says an awful lot. The other thing to have to think about is the relative nutritive value of the plants in the foraging environment. Relative nutritive value. All plants are a combination of two things. You've got quality and you've got anti-quality factors. And the two together then give us a relative nutritive value. So one plant might be higher in quality, the other one might be higher in anti-quality. Makes a difference how those two interrelate on whether or not an animal will eat it or not. Quality factors. Things like nutrients, proteins, energy, vitamins, minerals. Do they have soft leaves, low shear or tensile strength so they're easily, uh, easily grazed? Growth form, upright. An upright growth form is easier for an animal to eat. A high leaf to stem ratio. Animals prefer leaves over stems, so any plant that has more leaves than stems is something they would prefer to eat. The anti-quality factors. Uh, plant secondary metabolites, toxins, things like alkaloids, terpenes, phenols, glycosides, these are defensive compounds, chemical defense compounds that the plants have to prevent themselves from being eaten, along with stickers, prickers, and maybe even thorns. Their growth form is an anti-quality factor. If it's low and creepy or decumbent and the animal can't eat much of it, that gets in the way of high dry matter intake. And certainly if they have a high or a low leaf to stem ratio, meaning there's more stems than leaves, that's also an anti-quality factor. So when you look at these things together, think about the true nutritive value of a plant. It's probably best described as the sum of its positive chemical and physical attributes minus the sum of the negative chemical and physical attributes, in other words, the anti-quality factors. So, you know, at first blush, there's an awful lot of plants out there when you go to the, um, when you sample the plant and send it off to the laboratory for chemical analysis and it comes back high in energy, high in protein, uh, good fiber values, appears to be a very high quality plant. 
But one of the things we don't do is we don't test plants routinely for anti-quality factors. For example, um, alkaloids in tall fescue. Tall fescue is good in protein. It's good in energy. It's good and it's great when you look at the numbers. Leafy vegetative, tall fescue, good plant based on just the positive attributes. But it's crammed right full of alkaloids. And these alkaloids lower the value of that plant. So the true nutritive value of tall fescue is a whole lot less than what you might first think. And I looked at this a few years ago. I was doing some work with lactating dairy cows grazing orchard grass and or tall fescue. And the tall fescue forage samples, it looked like it was a superior quality plant over the orchard grass, higher in protein, higher in energy, better fiber values. And I was thinking maybe I would have to change my mind on because I really don't like tall fescue as a plant. It's, it's very toxic. And so the bottom line is those negative attributes, the toxins, when you add that or you subtract the toxins from the, the energy and protein, um, I was losing between 16 and 20 percent of milk production on the tall fescue over the orchard grass. And the reason being, yes, it was higher in protein and energy, but the animal had to utilize some of that protein and energy to detoxify and eliminate those toxins. And in that process, that lowered the milk production and that would lower animal performance as well. So the nutritive value of a plant is kind of a moving target. And it varies by things like the growth stage of the plant. You know, just because a plant is highly palatable and preferred at a leafy vegetative stage, by the time it gets a little stemmy and stocky and got some seed heads and some things out there that are in the way of good consumption by the animal, uh, that's a much lower quality plant. Plants change over the time of day. In the morning, plants are generally higher in protein and lower in energy. By afternoon, they're higher in energy and lower in protein. Time of year, spring versus fall. The soil type and fertility. You know, when plants are growing on a deep, well-drained, um, highly fertile soil, they're pretty darn happy. They get to grow lots of leaves under those kind of conditions. And if they get eaten because it's deep, well-drained soil, they've got moisture and fertility, they'll just go ahead and grow more leaves. If you take that same plant and you grow it on a shallow to bedrock, acidic, hot, dry place, uh, that kind of plant is going to have higher amounts of, of toxins. It'll have less protein and energy. It can't afford to be eaten because there's not enough moisture or fertility to regrow. So it tends, those plants tend to be higher in defensive compounds than plants that are growing on the deep, well-drained, highly fertile soils. And certainly the same pattern uh, shows with landscape position and aspect. I think we all know the north east slope is the coldest and the west and southern slopes are the hottest. So foods then that, that are selected by livestock or herbivores are the ones that generally meet their most specific requirements. Those are the ones that they prefer to eat, while those that are deficient in nutrients or in excess of nutrients or toxins, they're less preferred or avoided. And this is one of those bell-shaped curve kind of uh, diagrams I have here. And with Thanksgiving coming up, my family generally gets together to celebrate a uh, large extended family and, and people will bring things like uh, dishes to pass and some folks will be asked to bring the relish tray and on that relish tray, you're going to find things like, like uh, celery sticks and pickles and those kind of, kind of things. And those are not very high in nutrition. Other people in the family will be asked to bring the foods that are called desserts. Very high in calories, actually excessive in nutrients. So on one side of the bell-shaped curve, we have foods that are inadequate to meet our needs, other foods that are excessive. The rest of us will be asked to bring things like turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, green bean casserole, 
uh, scalloped corn, and those sorts of things. On Thanksgiving Day, I will eat some of these. I will snag a celery stick off that relish tray. I will save room for dessert. But by and large, the foods that's going to be on my plate in the greatest amount will be the foods that most closely meet my nutritional requirements, the turkey and the gravy and the, and the beans and so on and so forth. And this is pretty much what our animals are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, they will eat some of this stuff, and yes, they will eat some of this, but by and large, they're looking to maximize intake of the foods that meet their specific nutrient nutritional requirements. One of the things then that, that comes into play when they're out foraging in an environment is experience with the food. If they come across a the food they've never seen before, they have to wonder what it is. They wonder how much there is. Is it worth even taking a bite of it? They wonder if it tastes good. They also wonder things like how nutritious is it versus how toxic is it? And as it turns out, the primary game plan for all of us, all of us that eat foods, is played out right here between these two factors. Nutrient density versus toxicity. And the reason for that is all foods contain toxins or when consumed in large enough quantities can act as a toxin. And from the animal's viewpoint, it's generally not in the best interest of the animal to be the first in the herd or the flock to eat the most toxic plant in the pasture. You know, I can remember there's every once in a while you'll hear stories about um, young people that will try to out drink each other. Sometimes it's done with hops and barley, um, some other things, but sometimes you'll hear about them trying to out drink water. I don't know why they do such a thing, but every once in a while somebody will end up dead because they drink too much water. And we don't really think of water being overly toxic in most cases. But the truth of the matter is, if you drink enough water, you can reduce your electrolytes. And if you reduce your electrolytes, your brain no longer gets the opportunity to send electrical signals out to your heart to keep your heart beating. So excessive amounts of water can also even turn out to be or act like a toxin. And in that case, if it kills an animal, it becomes a poison. So over the millennia, animals have adapted to this, and they have something that's called neophobia, neophobic. Neo means early, and phobia is a fear. So it's an early fear of new or novel foods. They don't just eat a whole lot of stuff that they've never seen before. And I don't know about you folks, but I have an allergy to seafoods and anything, that, and I learned that as a youngster by eating scallops for the very first time. And I can tell you that it was not pleasant. And every time I smell seafood, it kind of brings back a memory that's not so good. So I, I don't eat a lot of novel or new foods. It's just, if I see something new, new I'll give it a, a look at it, I'll smell it, I'll, I'll take a small bite of it, but I don't eat a whole lot of anything that's considered a new food. And neither did these lambs. Um, back in 1993, I had a chance to take a, a summer short course when I was working for the government out at Utah State University where I met Fred Provenza. And what I did was a study of six lambs that had never eaten or seen Uncle Ben's dry rice in their entire lives. So every morning I measured out 400 grams of dry rice and dumped it in their little individual pens, in their little individual feed bunks, and I gave it to them for about 30 minutes. And the look on this guy's face is pretty much the summarizes what they did on the first day. They stuck their nose in the, the feed bunk, they sniffed it, you could hear them eat a little bit of it, and then they backed off and stood there and made unhappy sheep sounds until we finally fed them alfalfa pellets. But here's what my data looked like over a seven-day trial. On day number one, again, these sheep had never seen rice before. Nothing wrong with rice as far as a, a, a 
energy source for these sheep. They had just never seen it. So I measured out 400 grams. They got to look at it and eat it for about 30 minutes, and here's how much they actually ate, maybe 10 or 15 grams. The very next day, same sort of a situation. I gave it to them for 30 minutes, and they ate a little bit more. They tasted it. They remembered it from yesterday. It didn't make them feel bad, so they ate a little bit more. Day number three, oh, yeah, same stuff, still felt okay, and so now they're up to eating about 100 grams. By day number four, they'd gotten used to eating rice. They're eating about 250 grams, and they're deciding maybe they like the stuff. Well, on day number five, I mixed it with onion powder. I just changed the smell, and the intake dropped like a rock. Same food, but it now smells different. And so they had to taste a little bit of it again and start the process all over. Day number six, they're right back to where they were over here on day number four. So the onion powder didn't make them sick. They didn't feel bad. Uh, didn't change the outcome in terms of the nutrients. And so they ate it. And on day number seven, uh, they're eating almost all of that rice in a 30-minute period. So this is what neophobia looks like. Anytime you offer a new food to an animal, there's a slow intake while they learn what it is. And in the case of these lambs or these sheep, um, what I learned was if you're going to feed rice to sheep, you should feed it with onion powder because they seem to prefer that. So food neophobia then, from an evolutionary standpoint, likely evolved to prevent animals from overeating plants with toxic properties that were not easily identified by the herbivores until it was too late. So they had to learn to cautious sampling. The other thing has to do with how much food do you eat. In other words, too much experience with food. And these things are called transient or conditioned taste aversions. Eating the same food over and over again is not a good way to like that particular food because eating any food causes a temporary or a transient aversion to the flavor of the food just eaten. And eating a food to satiety, in other words, eating it till you can't take another bite, or too often, day after day after day, causes fairly strong aversions to form. And these taste aversions result in animals wanting to eat a whole bunch of different kinds of foods, not just a single kind of food day after day after day. And this is kind of interesting because in the dairy business, we're often telling people that uh, dairy cows like to be bored, and the best way to feed them is to feed them the same thing day after day after day. And a couple of years ago, I guess almost 10 now, I had the opportunity to put this to somewhat of a test uh, with grazing dairy cows that had been grazing orchard grass for about two straight weeks. I had a pasture seeded down to orchard grass with clover, and the other half of it was seeded down to tall fescue with clover. And I was able to fence it off in strips so that when the cows actually came into the pasture, they had a choice. Did they want to eat more orchard grass and clover, or did they want to eat something different? After all, they had been eating orchard grass for the last two weeks. Maybe they would like to eat something else. They had both, or these animals had experience to tall fescue, so it was not a novel food. It was just something else for them to eat. And here's what my data looks like. On the very first day that those cows that had been eating orchard grass for the last two weeks, when they moved into the pasture where they had a choice to eat tall fescue or more orchard grass, as the yellow line indicates, which is the amount of orchard grass they ate, on day number one, about 38% of their diet was orchard grass, and 62% of their diet was tall fescue. However, by day number two, you can see that about 55% of their diet was orchard grass, or excuse me, tall fescue, and now 45% of their diet is orchard grass. By day number three, it was a complete reversal. They were eating almost the same amount of, of orchard grass as they had been the tall fescue just two days before. And the same can be said for the, the tall fescue. 
day number four, you can see the lines are starting to cross again. And if I'd had more pasture and a longer time to do this study, I'm fairly confident these lines would have continued to cross back and forth just like they did in the first three days here, or the first four days. They don't like to eat the same thing over and over and over. It seems that I think koala bears and something else, and I can't remember what it is. There's very few animals that just have a single source of food in their diet. All the rest of us like to have diversity. And as it turns out, conditioned taste aversions from this evolutionary standpoint likely evolved to prevent animals from overeating plants that were either too high or too low in nutritional attributes or that had toxic properties that were detrimental to growth or reproduction. So at any given point in time, any one of the animals on your farm or anywhere you see an animal, including yourself, at any given point in time, an individual animal is selecting what to eat based on its age, its physiological condition, its previous experience with the foods on offer, its recent diet, and the relative nutritive values of the plants that are in the foraging, foraging environment. And it just turns out then there's a whole lot more to diet selection than the luck of the bite. All right, I want to finish with uh, just offering a few behavioral-based management uh, considerations and things that you can do on your farms to help you help your animals uh, to harvest more of the foods that they want to eat and increase their productivity. First of all, I think it's important to recognize that grazing behavior and diet selection are learned behaviors. And the best way to learn about foods is to start young and get help from a social model. Certainly, who taught you what to eat and when? It was mom and it was early in your life. Social models in this case can be with a, a, a foster mom, doesn't have to be with a true mom. Getting started early in life with young calves, especially dairy calves, is very important if you want these animals, animals to be good at grazing. Probably the worst way to, to start a dairy calf, if you want that animal to be good at grazing as an adult and eat lots of forage and make lots of milk, is to stand have them tied up to a, a calf hutch where the only thing they really learn is that they stand here and look cute or pathetic. Some human comes along and feeds them. That teaches them nothing about harvesting foods on their own. You want to accommodate the natural foraging cycle of the animal. Our ruminants, our herbivores are generally crepuscular, meaning they're gray light active. They don't like to graze so much in the middle of the day or middle of the night, but the gray light hours first thing in the morning and those gray light hours going into evening are the times when they are naturally inclined to eat a lot of food. They'll graze for about eight hours, they ruminate for eight hours, and they'll rest for about eight hours. Uh, generally speaking though, maximum intake, gray light hours, morning and night. A lot of dairy farmers have their cows in the barn being milked at the time when the cow wants to be out in the pasture eating. So if you want to feed expensive foods to the cow in the barn or cheap foods to the cow in the pasture, maybe you should change the time that you milk by an hour or so. Keep in mind dry matter intake from the animal perspective is a function of three things. Biting rate, how many bites per minute do they take? Bite size, how much food do they get in with each and every bite? And the amount of time that they spend grazing. And anything that interferes with this process is going to reduce dry matter intake and thus your animal performance. Pastures that tend to be low yielding or too short, forage height less than four inches, cause animals to walk further, they graze longer, they eat less, and they produce less meat, milk, and fiber. Pastures that are too tall and rank, and I'm going to say anything that's taller than 12 inches is more like a hay field than a pasture, and these things will cause animals to decrease bite rate, they'll take fewer bites, they take longer to fill up, and again, they too produce less meat, milk, and fiber. And certainly any pasture where animals have to walk between bites, that sort of misses the point of pasture being a source of food. 
I recommend most of the time the pastures be somewhere around eight inches tall with animals turn in. Thick, dense grass legume combinations. They should be grazed to no shorter than two to two and a half inches. You also want to keep in mind this notion of animals do not like to eat the same foods day after day after day and that has to do with the conditioned taste aversions. So to reduce those taste aversions, pastures should be seeded to diverse mixtures. Monocultures should be avoided. Keep in mind some research I've seen from around the world study after study suggests that unsupplemented livestock prefer legumes over grasses by a 70 to 30 percent ratio. And that's not just a little preference, that's a huge preference. They love clover. So make sure you've got a good amount of clover in your pastures. Food neophobia. Animals don't eat what they don't recognize. So anytime you're seeding down a new pasture to something that they've never seen before, you can expect them not to eat it. I recommend that you seed them interseed new species with old species, something that they are familiar with. That way they can eat what they know, they can cautiously sample the new stuff, and you don't, you don't lose uh, production while they're learning what the new food is. You also want to make sure you've got water very near to where the animals are foraging. Uh, plant secondary metabolites, PSM, those are the toxins. And the solution to pollution from the environmental side of things is dilution. So when a cow or an animal is out grazing a diverse pasture and they have got lots of different plants with lots of different toxins, toxins will shut down intake. And these animals that have overloaded on toxins, they can keep right on grazing if they have enough water because the water is the universal solvent and the universal solvent then helps the animal to dilute and um, get rid of the toxins that they have been eating. So keep in mind toxins are not always a bad thing. A lot of the medicines we take are in fact toxins. It's a matter of how much of it they actually eat. If you overeat lots of things, toxin can turn into a poison and the best way is to, to avoid that is to make sure you drink enough water to detoxify and eliminate those toxins. Soil fertility, that'd be the last thing I'd like to talk about today. You know, I said earlier that plants, in terms of nutritive value, plants change their nutritive value by their growing environment. And one of the things I mentioned was um, shallow to bedrock soils or soils that are low in fertility. So if you've got different plants on a pasture, some are growing well and some are not growing so well. Places where animals eat them, places where animals don't eat them. You might want to look at the soil fertility because if a plant is growing in an environment that has good soil fertility, good soil type, good lime, it's going to put out more leaves and less toxins, more nutrients, less toxins. So this is sort of a, an equalizer. So get the soil tested, find out what's lacking and get it all pretty much the same so the plants don't have to create large amounts of toxins rather than nutrients in order to survive. And not only does the, the nutrients uh, make the, the particular plants that are growing there uh, taste better, it changes the plant diversity as well. This is just a, a piece of property that I own across the road from my home. And when I bought it, this is my property line, it all looked pretty much like this, pale green grass. My father-in-law and brother-in-law are dairy farmers, and so I let them uh, spread manure, and you can see the side slinger manure spreader where the, the nutrients landed on this grass. And you can see that my side of the line, I've got all kinds of red clover, you can see the red uh, red flowers all over. It's thicker, it's denser, and I've added a lot of diversity to the pasture by adding soil fertility factors. So where we had no soil fertility added in years and years and years versus where the, the manure spreader came through, lots of plant diversity, better growth, 
higher yields. So soil fertility, very important factor to high animal performance. So in the final analysis, I think if we're looking to optimize the performance and health of our livestock and do, do so at reduced costs with the least amount of environmental damage and with the least amount of stress on both human and animal alike, I think we need to do a better job of understanding their behavior. We need to stop dictating to them what they're going to get because they might not like it. And we need to start accommodating what it is they really need to live contented and healthy lives. And that is the end of my tale. Daryl, you had talked about in your um, in the study about the cow's preferences. Um, this person was asking about was there a difference in mil the milk production that you saw um, while the cows were going back and forth from orchard grass to the tall fescue? The difference in milk production was about 16 to 20 percent less with the tall fescue. And we had cows that were at, at 75 to 80 pounds of milk with pasture plus supplementation. And it was 20, 16 to 20 percent less with the t when they hit the tall fescue. OK, great. Thank you. Um, this person's asking if you could talk about gray light. Gray light is that time of day when uh, sun is coming up or going down. Um, Herbivores are a prey species, and over the millennia, uh, lions, tigers, and bears really ate a lot of the prey species if they happened to be standing out in the middle of a wide open space in broad daylight. So the animals that uh, learned that the best time to be out in wide open spaces t in terms of survival would be out there at the, in the gray light hours, early morning, um, late evening, that's the time when they're out maximizing dry matter intake from pasture. So those are, those are the times based on predator-prey relationships that suggest animals are far more active. They fill up their rumens, and then they want to slink back into the, the brush, so to speak, from yesteryear to survive in the face of predators. So gray light, early morning, late evening hours. Great, thank you. So what do you think about teaching animals to eat non-toxic weeds versus allowing for their own preferences? Animals have been eating non-toxic weeds forever. Um, certainly, I'm not sure that we have to spend much time uh, teaching them to do that. Uh, in some cases, yes, because and this is overcoming neophobia. If they've never eaten a non-toxic weed for whatever the reason is, maybe they've moved into a new pasture where the where the weed is present, but they've never seen it before. So that's they're going to be rather skeptical of the new the new food, and in this case, a weed. But if you watch animals grazing, especially here in the Northeast, they're munching on yarrow, they're munching on dandelions, they're munching on plantain, they're they're munching away on lots of things that we would consider, in some cases, weeds. So they're doing that on their own. What they don't do is eat the plants that are toxic enough that says, nope, we're not going to bother with this. OK, great. Um, this is a question about when to turn um, in cows to a pasture. Um, and I think you had said eight inches. Uh, this person says, cows will have way too loose manure, have high MUNs, and get skinny due to not enough fiber. The height of grass when it's ready to make hay, 12 to 14 inches high, has the highest amount of dry matter and bricks readings in comparison to eight inch high or 18 inches high pastures. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts on that are that uh, when you're looking at the, the overall, the overall um, use of pasture, if it's too short, they're, they're not getting enough intake. And certainly the, the shorter leafy plants are higher in protein, higher in energy, but they do end up not getting enough to eat from, from too short of a plant. When the plant gets too tall and the, the vegetation is rank, the, the stems and stalks are to the point where the, the shear strength and the, and the tensile strength get to the point where they can't bite it and shear it off with their head in a head down position, they're losing intake. 
So again, thinking about bricks and thinking about the chemical analysis of plants that we use for nutrition, uh, don't forget the rest of those anti-quality factors. The stems and stalks, that's an anti-quality factor. A hay bind or a mower doesn't care about stems and stalks. It'll mow them off whether they're two feet tall or, or, or three feet tall. And they don't care how stemmy or stalky. The animal does care. They prefer leaf, green leaf over stem, even green stem. They prefer brown leaf over green stem. They're looking for quality and by and large between good harvest efficiency um, and animal performance. I like that eight inch height because they do a good job of eating it and they're harvesting a lot of it. Excellent, great. Um, so this is a question about your thoughts on rotational grazing. Um, it's, uh, this person says, in my experience, the open pasture method is like turning my kids loose at a buffet. They eat all the dessert and never touch the salad, and that's bad for both cows and forages. Something exactly coming. right, and that's why we make a paddock size for rotational grazing small enough that when the animals come in, that for a specific time period, for example, dairy cows come in in the morning and they, they'll they graze in the morning, they'll graze somewhat during the day, and when they come off the pasture at in the evening to be milked, they're going to go to a different pasture once they come back out of the barn. So moving them twice a day, they're going to get short stuff, they're going to get some weeds, they're going to get some of the taller plants, they're being forced to eat it all, you know, they're selecting all, all that they can select, but in order to meet dry matter intake requirements, they're going to be eating some things that may not be their favorite, but it is still adding to their dry matter intake. Great, and this is maybe um, related. So based on the preference for a varied um, diet, which, which would be a better design? Mixed fields with two or more species of grass or a patchwork of single species pastures? You know, in, there's things we do in research and there's things that farmers do or can do or can't do. And, you know, in a, in a perfect world, it'd be, it would be really nice to have strips of clover versus strips of grass and, you know, laid out in a mosaic so that animals could walk over and eat exactly what they wanted to eat when they wanted to eat it. And research conditions, that shows uh, an improvement in dry matter intake and animal improvement animal performance. However, when I was doing some research back from my PhD, I did have paddocks that were laid out in strips. And the first thing that I learned in a hurry on a wet thunderstorm night is that when the cows move into a clover strip, there is not enough um, root mass to hold cows up in the rain. And so mm. the whole notion then of of a nice clover strip turned it into more of a sea of mud in just an overnight rainstorm. So from that perspective, to keep something in a pasture that will stay, because that's the, that's the big thing about pastures is we like a pasture to be seeded down and keep it there for, for several years without ever having to do anything to do it with it. Sustainable agriculture means you don't have to fix it year after year after year. So in order to do that, I think grass legume combinations mixed across the, the pasture in a practical sense probably is as good as it's going to get, unless you have a really specific way to handle uh, putting uh, different species out in a patchwork quilt type of an arrangement. Great, and, and then I ha there's a couple of questions here about your recommendations um, for the best pasture mix for grazing dairy cattle in the southeast as well as the north, um, the northeast. Well, I'm not that familiar with what can grow in the southeast for for pasture, so I would I would send that person to a, a local expert to answer that. But in terms of, of the Northeast, um, I've always been in favor of orchard grass and Ladino white clover as the primary species to, to actually seed in the pasture. And then let Mother Nature fill in the rest because there's all kinds of grass seeds out there that's in the soil 
that are going to germinate and come on. Um, predominantly orchard grass. You could you could put in some rye grass, but it tends to to winter kill. Um, Timothy also adding to the mixture, but it doesn't grow as well in midsummer as the orchard grass does. So if you start with the orchard grass clover base and let um, Mother Nature fill in the rest, I think you're doing a pretty good. You've got a pretty good start. So is the goal to have uh, uh, multiple species of grass in there as well? Grasses as well as even things like dandelion. You know, those are those are excellent quality forages. They might be considered a weed by some people, but watch your dairy cow or any cow munch them down. And quality-wise, they're almost as good a quality as a lot of the grasses um, that we commonly see. Okay, great. Um, so the, uh, there are a couple of questions about the clover ratio. Um, first of all, you, um, this one says, uh, cows pref you mentioned that cows prefer clover over grasses. So is there any difference in preference about red clover versus white clover? Um, yeah, the, the, the studies from around the world, you know, they've looked at, at grass clover preferences and it's a the ratio of 70% legume versus 30% grass is what an unsupplemented animal whether it's a beef cow, a sheep or even a even a dairy cow that's their natural preference it's 70 to 30% ratio the kind of clovers and the kind of of legumes that you would put in a pasture um, a lot of times they don't like to eat red clover but i tell people putting red clover in a pasture because it's so deep, deeply rooted, it gives us one of those opportunities to survive in droughty weather. Whereas white clover, which is my preference, Ladino tall upright uh, clovers, um, any of the varieties that are tall and upright, um, are the ones that you would want to use. And generally speaking, they last longer and tend to be more preferred than the than the red clover, but when you get into hot, dry summer and the and the white clover is not producing well, the animals will then uh, have red clover in their diet. Okay, and then um, this person says, um, you know, we have the seventy thirty grass uh, clover grass ratio, but um, for cattle, but what about horses? Um, that's a different that's a different deal. I wouldn't I wouldn't put that much clover out there for a horse. I have a whole lot less. Okay. In fact, more more grass and less clover for the horses. I've not seen work um, where it's been demonstrated that they that they like that clover as much as as ruminants do. Okay, and what about small ruminants, sheep and goats? It's the same same deal. They they like the clover as well. Okay, great. Now um, we have a couple of questions about other um, species like alfalfa. How does alfalfa and uh, bird's foot trefoil fit into the picture? Alfalfa, I don't see unless you've got a real uh, need for on droughty soils as a insurance policy to have something in the middle of the summer. Alfalfa doesn't tend to hold up as well as I would like and it's costly to put in and maintain. Bird's foot trefoil, um, it's one of those plants that has quite a bit of um, uh, tannin, high tannin content, and a lot of times animals will not eat bird's foot trefoil except for when they have high parasite loads because the tannins in the bird's foot trefoil help with um, worm control. So that's one of the, tannin is a toxin but in this case, it's turning out to be more of a medicine rather than a poison. So I don't see anything wrong with bird's foot trefoil in a pasture. If a person wanted to put it in there, it is hard to establish. I tried a number of years ago when I worked for Cornell University uh, back in the 80s. We seeded down several pastures with bird's foot trefoil. And as hard as I tried, I could not get it per to persist for very long. But certainly, it is a high-quality forage. It grows well. Um, when they eat it or when they don't eat it, that's the question. Okay. Um, and then someone had, had written in, speaking of tannins, um, someone had said, I have read that tannins are higher in the stems, and are there any tricks to get them to eat some of those stems? Um, you know, you can starve animals, and that's never usually a, a, a good way to get them to eat something, but certainly 
uh, tighter, more animals per acre so that they're eating more of what's out there in terms of dry matter intake requirements, um, you know, increasing the grazing pressure, in other words, make the paddock size smaller so that the competition from one animal to the next says, I better eat this before she or he does because it may not be here when I'm ready to eat it. So that's that's about the only way to get animals to, to eat some of those plants is to increase the grazing pressure on them. Okay, and one more question uh, um, uh, is about bloating with the 70% legume. Should we be yeah, concerned a, about that? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the, the, the bloating thing is something we talk about and we talk about and we have to be aware of. But out in the in the farms that I've worked with over the past 30 or so years, we talk about bloat, but we don't see bloat very often. And when I used to lecture a lot, I would ask people, has anybody had significant amounts of bloat? And every once in a while, somebody will raise their hand and say, I have. And I say, well, how many animals do you have and how many have bloated? And they'll say, well, I had two bloat this year, but I've got 70 cows and they've been grazing for the past 10 years or five years or a very long time. So when you add up all those cows or animals and all those days that they were out feeding on high legume pastures and you end up with two that bloat, certainly if that's your favorite two animals or your highest producers, that is a problem because anytime you lose an animal you don't have to lose, um, that's an issue. But I don't see bloat anywhere near as much as we talk about it. Of course, as soon as I say that, somebody will have half their herd died. But I think <laughs> if they have, they have other things to eat along with the clover, I'm not so concerned about. Never put them in when they're really, really hungry. It's about the only thing I can say. Make sure okay. they have op options to eat other things. Dr. Emick, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really a pleasure. You're entirely welcome. And thank you all for, for coming. <laughs>